Well, this morning, um, I was going to actually do a, a message on who you should vote for. Mm-hmm. And uh, not necessarily by name, but, but how, how. And, and it sort of ties into a message that I did earlier because the primaries are coming up here in just a few weeks and we will be voting on a, a candidate um, uh, to represent the Republican Party. It's a very important, very important election. I want to encourage all of you, if you're not registered to vote, to register to vote and, and to vote biblically and morally rather than economically or uh, politically. And, and so, but I'm going to postpone that until next week. And instead, when I talked to uh, Jerry on the phone this past week and found out that they were coming, I started thinking, well, I'm going to do something that ties more into missions uh, rather than, because we've still got two weeks. So next Sunday, I can give you the, the message that I was going to do this Sunday. So that's why on the front of the bulletin, actually, the, uh, the verses that are listed there will go along with next week's message, and they'll be on the front of next week's bulletin as well. But um, in the providence of God, with Jerry calling and coming, and, and with the seminar that we went to the other day, uh, I've been uh, just challenged again, and, and I know I started the year with a challenge for us to, to remember the Great Commission and to be involved in it. But I want to I continue with that theme a little bit this morning. You know, Jesus, as he called people to follow him, uh, told those followers that he would make them, if they followed him, he would make them fishers of men. He said that at the beginning of his ministry, and he said that near the end of his ministry. And so being fishers of men, that is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with those who do not know Christ, is a fundamental part of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's not something optional or something that only the paid clergy do. It's not something that only those maybe who have been to a seminar or two on evangelism do. It is what every disciple, every follower, every pupil, every learner of Jesus ought to be involved in. Fishing. Fishing for men. And so I want to encourage you this morning uh, to do that and to be involved in that. After his resurrection, uh, Jesus gave to the church what we call today the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 27 and at the end of some of the other Gospels as well that we are to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all things, all things. Whatever the Lord has taught them, they were to teach others to obey as well. Now, there have been some people that say, well, you know, the Great Commission was given to the disciples, and I think if you take it in context, that's who it belongs to, the disciples, uh, uh, you know, the the professional followers of Christ. But even in the Great Commission, even in the Great Commission, Jesus said, teach them to obey all things that I've taught you. And so the Great Commission is passed on to every disciple of the disciples and throughout the church age. And the church has recognized that from the very beginning, that it is the responsibility of each and every Christian, and not just the responsibility, but the awesome privilege of sharing the great news, the good news, that Jesus Christ will forgive men and women and children of their sins and give unto them eternal life so that they can not only spend eternity with God in heaven, but have a living and vibrant relationship with him here and now in this life. We, we see an example of the church doing this in the book of Acts, and it's one of my favorite passages that illustrates the fact that believers not only recognized but accepted the commission of Christ to go into the world and preach the gospel. And so if you have your Bibles with you this morning, and I hope you do, would you please turn to Acts chapter 8. And I trust that many of you are familiar with this passage, but let's take another look at it this morning. Acts chapter 8. Read along with me, please. Verses 1 through 4. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all, and all except the apostles, were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen. He was the one that Saul was giving his approval to as far as his martyrdom. Godly men uh, buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. 
those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we look at this uh, short passage in the book of Acts, a, a wonderful book that records the history of the spread of the gospel, your gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of salvation from the land of Jerusalem all the way into the other parts of the Gentile world that surrounded Jerusalem. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would refire, as Jerry put it, refire us, reignite the flame and the passion and the desire uh, to be busy about sharing Christ with others. That that wouldn't just be something we occasionally do, but that would be the center of our thoughts and of our life and of our purpose here on earth. To help men and women pass from death and condemnation unto life, eternal life. And to experience the forgiveness of sins and the love of the Heavenly Father. And so, Father, uh, help us this morning. Help us this morning again to be rekindled, uh, to be, have our passion reignited as we look at your word. In Jesus' name, amen. One, one of the first things you note here in this passage is that persecution had begun to break out in the church. And this was soon after the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it wasn't new to the church, even though the church was in its infancy. The church was experiencing persecution from the very moment that Jesus started his public ministry. I mean, almost immediately, Jesus faced opposition in his ministry. And he told his, his, his followers, the believers, constantly throughout his ministry that, hey, if they treat me this way, don't expect better treatment. As the student, don't expect better treatment than the master. If the world hated me, Jesus said, the world will also hate you. And the reason that it hates us is because of our stand for Christ, our identification with Christ, our preaching of the gospel, which is to them that perish, foolishness. And it's a stumbling block and an offense to many people. And, and so the world doesn't like it. It's also a rebuke in the sense that we're, we're talking to men about repenting, men and women, and about repenting from their sins and turning from their ways, their evil ways, the ways of wickedness, as the Bible calls it, and, and turning to Christ for forgiveness and seeking to walk and live in holiness. And, and so from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, persecution arose. And of course, we all know that it was the persecution against Jesus that resulted in his death on the cross. Even though that was a part of the eternal plan of God, it, it was uh, the persecution of, of the Jewish community as well as others uh, toward Christ that led to his crucifixion. And the church recognized then that this is part and parcel with being a Christian uh, to one degree or another. Now, after being at the seminar yesterday, I don't feel quite qualified to speak on this topic. As you listen to brothers and sisters who live daily with, with not only very real threats of persecution, but with, with the actual carrying out of persecution, where, where it's not just a threat. It's not just something they hear about. It's not just something that they acknowledge and know about, as, as is the case with most of us. It's something they live through as brothers and sisters are, are killed for the cause of Christ, as, as parents or children are killed for the cause, cause of Christ, as neighbors and friends are, are killed for the cause of Christ. In fact, it was surprising to me, many of the videos that we um, saw at the seminar, the short video clips that were used there, we've seen here at Grace and we've showed to you at, as a congregation over a period of time, but um, it, I was surprised to hear that some of the people that we saw in the videos were related to some of the speakers. And Brother John from Syria. Do you remember um, the woman who, who portrayed the role of a mother there in Syria with her children? And, t and, was t uh, and you may not remember the video without actually seeing a clip of the video, but where she talked to her children about the fact that someday men may break into their home with swords and, and that they, they might kill them. And, and uh, yet they might let him live. And if Jesus wants to, he can protect him. And, then she, and she mentions the part, is this something that a good mother does with her children? That talks has to talk about with her children. And, and it was a very moving video. I remember when I saw it here at, at church, I thought, well, I've got to preach after this. I can't, can't start crying in the middle of the video. But, you know, some of those videos bring you to tears. Well, we met Brother John, who is that woman's brother. Now, that mother in that video uh, who lives in Syria and faces that kind of persecution and the, the very real, and again, not just threat, but, but living with it all around them. And, and so there are people, there are people in the world today uh, that, 
are uh, facing what we read about here in this particular passage in the book of Acts on a regular basis. And, and when you hear from those people, you, you sort of feel like, gee whiz, who am I to speak on the topic of persecution? But I'm really not speaking on persecution as much this morning as the fact that persecution accompanies the sharing of the gospel and that that ought to never hinder the believer from preaching. It doesn't stop them. It certainly ought not to stop us. And we don't face anything like what they face. We don't face anything like what we see here in this particular passage. Uh, here uh, it mentions that Stephen had just been martyred uh, for the cause of Christ. And godly men buried him. And so the Christian community was aware of what was happening to them as Saul was beginning to ravage the church. And he had, he had orders. He had a, a authoritative documents to allow him to do what he was doing there in Jerusalem. And, and so uh, he begins to uh, attack the church. And it says in verse 1, in the second half of that verse again, on that day a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And it was so great that it says that all except the apostles were scattered. Now, I, I'm, I'm sure the all is probably some sort of hyperbole, but the, the bottom line is the, the vast majority of believers took off. By the way, it's not wrong to flee from persecution. It's also not wrong to stay in the midst of persecution. One side can't condemn the other. Because what we see is it all except the apostles were scattered. The apostles stayed. And by the way, there's no condemnation. There's no condemnation on those who left. It doesn't say, and all the cowardly Christians took off. No, those who were fleeing for their lives and to protect their family were allowed to flee. And we know that even the apostles on occasion fled. We know that Jesus... Jesus walked through the midst of the crowd at certain times. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that, I, I do know that in church history there were those who desired to be martyrs for the cause of Christ. And I understand that, yet on the other hand, you don't have to desire to be a martyr for the cause of Christ. You can desire to live for the cause of Christ. And that's the most important part, is living for the cause of Christ. But we have most of the Christian community, apparently, there may be, have been some, again, this may be a hyperbole, but most of the Christian community, because of the severity of the persecution and the fact that, that Saul of Tarsus now had authority uh, to put men and women to death, and so they fled. They left. They, they got out of that particular area. And it goes on to say in verse 3 that Saul began to destroy the church. And that's why I say some, apparently this is a hyperbole when it says all, that there were some that did stay in that area. Otherwise there would have been no church there in Jerusalem for Saul to continue to ravage and to continue to destroy. And it says going from house to house he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Now let me ask you a question. If you knew that there was a, a very high degree of probability that you would lose your house and your possessions and that you would be thrown into jail for sharing Jesus with others, would you still do it? Now I know a lot of times we think, that, yeah, I would do it. It's sort of like, you know, we watch the movies where somebody rescues somebody. Well, I'd dive into the water and I'd save that person. I'd jump on that hand grenade and I'd save that platoon. And we always think of the noble things that we would do just like we see, you know, other people doing it in the movies. But in reality, you know what, if we're not doing those kind of things now, we probably wouldn't do those things when the situation arose. If we're afraid to share Christ now, if we're worried about what people think about us at work, or we're worried about what people think about us in school, or we're worried about what people think about us in our community, our neighbors, those who live next door to us, to the point where it hinders us from sharing Jesus Christ with them, what makes us think that if real persecution broke out, we would be more bold. Now maybe, maybe if everybody else was going through it, we, we would sort of join with them and just say, you know what, it's coming, there is no escaping it, and we'd lock arms with our brothers and sisters in Christ and we'd share Christ no matter what, even if it meant losing our possessions and being thrown into jail. But I, I'm going to guess that there would be many in professing Christianity today uh, that would, would close their mouths and remain silent and would avoid the persecution by not sharing Christ. But that's not what we see here. In fact, it tells us as we go on, here's the amazing thing, is that as these people fled from one place to another to escape the persecution, you might think that they would be quiet in their new place, right? Wherever they had fled to. 
And it doesn't tell us exactly where they went to. Verse 4 just says those who had been scattered. And, and so we don't know exactly where they went to. Maybe they went to relatives' homes. Maybe they, maybe they just were living out in the countryside, um, sort of as nomads and tents or how, we don't know. But rather than being quiet now so that they could begin to rebuild their lives and regather some possessions and, and, and gain some sort, again, a, a semblance of, of normality, of making a living and surviving, instead of doing that, what did they continue to do? Verse 4, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. They continued to preach the gospel. They, firsthand, they had already lost all of their things for Christ. But I, I guess as the Apostle Paul said, those things that they once counted dear, now that they were Christians, they counted as lost for the cause of Jesus. So often we hang on so tightly to that which distracts us from serving Jesus, to the things of this world, to the things that are going to pass. And we cling to those things and we, we work for those things and we try to gain those things and we, we build those things. We amass those things. And, and, and then we're afraid to lose some of those things. And it's not material things that I'm talking about. Sometimes it's reputation. And we don't want people to think of us, oh, he's just one of those superstitious religious nuts. Sometimes it's, it's promotion. And we're afraid that the boss won't promote us if he knows that we're a Christian or if, we, if we're too religious. If we don't go along with the gang and laugh at the dirty jokes. And I've worked in places like that where, where when, you know, I mentioned before at one of the restaurants we worked at, the boss would call us up at the end of the day. And he purposely, he knew that the vast majority of us that were busboys at this particular restaurant went to the Bible college at that time. He knew that. And he would call us up at the end of the day and share with us some sort of dirty joke and then laugh. And, you know, there were, there were people there, there were other people there um, uh, that would go along with it, not, not even just Christians, but those who wanted, you know, to stay in good with the boss and maybe move up the ladder a little bit. And they would laugh at, oh, oh that was a good one, Jimmy. And that was his name, not the Jimmy that goes here. <laughs> but this was a different Jimmy. Uh, but we didn't laugh at his jokes. And, and we, would, we would walk away. We were respectful. We were employees, and we would come up. We were respectful to the individual. We tried to be, and we tried to balance that with living out our, our, our testimony, and 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 um, you know not being uh, not being obnoxious to him in the process of him being obnoxious to us. Sometimes that's hard. But do we fear? Do we fear for the possibility of promotion to the point where it hinders us from from sharing Christ with others? Are we as bold? as the believers here in the book of Acts were? Or, or are we more concerned with, with our stuff, and with our things, with our reputations, with our jobs, with whatever, that it hinders us from sharing Christ? Every time I read this, I think to myself, if I was in that situation, what would I do? I'd like to think I would be just like the rest of them, you know, sharing Christ no matter what happened, wherever we went. I, I hope that I would be just like the rest of them. But the bottom line is I haven't been tested in that way. I have had people make fun of me. I've had people close doors on me. Uh, I've had people, um, you know, mock me. But I've never had anybody, never, nobody's ever lifted a, a, a fist to me. Nobody's ever thrown a stone. We, there was a young American missionary to Africa. He's in... Um, one of the countries that are having elections, and I can't remember the name of the country now, on the, east, on the east coast of Africa, and he mentioned that he's been stoned twice um, for, for uh, being a Christian in, in that particular Muslim-dominated uh, country. And, and so that's never happened to me. And so while I'd like to say that I would stand fast with the brothers in Christ, I don't know. I hope that I would. But I can tell you this, if I'm not willing to do it now, and if I'm not doing it now, the chances of me doing it when things get worse is slim. And so I'm, what I want to do is, is not berate you, but encourage you. Share Christ now. No matter what it costs you. No matter what it costs you. It's worth losing your homes. Now, I, I wouldn't try to lose my homes. <laughs> you know, I, 
I, I wouldn't, I, again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so obnoxious that I lose my job for being obnoxious rather than sharing Christ. You know what I'm saying? And there are people like that. But don't, don't fudge on your Christian values. Don't fudge on your Christian standards. Don't fudge on sharing Jesus when you have the opportunity to share Jesus because of worrying about other things. Be like the early church. Be like the Lord Jesus Christ. Be like the disciples. First Peter, I think, uh, talks about this in a different way to the, the again, the first century Christians in First Peter chapter 3. And again, if you have your Bibles, just flip over there uh, for a minute. First Peter chapter 3. Beginning with verse 13. I'd like to read verses 13 through 18. Now, Peter's just talked about how the believers ought to behave themselves in their culture. And apparently, in behaving in this manner, in this type of manner, it would be different enough from the culture that people, people might persecute them in some way, might make fun of them or, or something else to the point where uh, they might have the opportunity to, to talk to those people because those people might say, hey, why do you undergo what you undergo to live the way that you live? And by that I mean, for example, in chapter 3, verse 1, we see, it says, wives in the same way be submissive to your husbands. And, and so Peter is encouraging uh, the Christian women to, to be submissive to their husbands in a, in a godly way, in a biblical way. And then in verse 7, he says, and husbands in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the, as the weaker partner. And again, I've mentioned that word weaker before as I've preached sermons on this passage. It has the idea of, of being preciously fragile. Like, like, like fine china. It's not the idea that she's necessarily physically or mentally weaker. Some people misinterpret that. It's the idea that she is precious and that you don't want to hurt it like you would handle the fine china and you don't want to drop it. You don't want to chip it because this is expensive stuff. This is good stuff. That's the way we're to treat our wives. And this is in a culture where, remember, in this day and age, women were viewed much like we would view property today. Ladies, if you think you're not treated well today, just be thankful you didn't live back then. And it was Christianity that elevated the status of women in the first century and throughout the ages. I mean, what most women today ought to be thanking Christianity rather than when they read some of these, I don't, I don't like that Bible stuff, be submissive to your husband. And, and they reject, but it, it's, actually, it's actually teachings in the Bible that helped women to gain a, a newer status in the Christian community with their husbands because the husbands in the same way be considered and live with your wives and treat them with respect as weaker partners. Well, you know what? When men started doing this in the church, the world in that day and age would, take a, would look at that and say, hey, what, what are you doing, man? Just tell her what to do. She's your slave. Because they were viewed much like that. You know, what do you mean? Treat them nicely. What's wrong with you? Give them an inch, they'll take a mile. You ever hear things like that? Even today, you treat your wife and you try to treat her with, oh, come on, man. Well, first century, it was worse. And he goes on. He says, finally, verse 8. Again, so we got the husband and wife relationships, and he's teaching them to live in a different manner than what they were used to living in in their culture and maybe the way they grew up. Verse 8, finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Those are virtues that even today aren't all that popular. Right? Today we, we watch Charles Bronson settle matters. We watch Clint Eastwood settle matters. <laughs> we watch Bruce Willis settle matters. We watch Arnold Schwarzenegger settle matters, matters in a way that we go, yeah, boom, 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 boom. You know? Not, not like this. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil. Now, hey, I like Charles Bronson. Clint, I grew up on those guys, okay? John Wayne, John Wayne was you know, a little more maybe uh, fair with people. Um, anyways. The biblical admonition, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. Folks, that is not only contrary to the culture of our day where it's get even, it was contrary to the culture of their day. And, and, and Peter's saying, live differently. Live differently than your culture. Live differently than the way that you were raised. Live differently than the unsaved. This is the way that the followers of Christ are to live. And in the process, as we love each other, as we are supposed to love each other, we get down to this passage here, verses 13 through 18, where it says, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. 
if you should suffer for doing right. What is doing right? It's living in this manner. And it's not just chapter 3. It's chapter 2. It's chapter 1. It's the teachings of Jesus. It extends to many different areas of life. And he says, hey, you know, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. We forget that. doesn't seem that way when you're going through the suffering. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. Don't be afraid that people will reject you. Don't be afraid you won't get invited to those parties anymore. Don't be afraid that you won't be invited out to the bar to have a few drinks with the boss afterwards or go play golf with them. Don't be afraid that you won't get that promotion. Don't be afraid that you won't get that college position. Don't be afraid. That's what he's saying. Right? Do not fear what they fear and do not be frightened, but in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. There's evangelism. Always be prepared to give an apologia is the Greek word there. And it's the idea of a defense. Why do you believe what you believe? Why do you have this hope? Why are you willing to live differently than the culture lives and in the manner that you live? Why don't you want to go out and get even with that guy? I mean, they took advantage of you. Why don't you want to return insult for insult? That guy just called you names. Didn't you hear him? Deck the guy. Come on, just pop him right in the nose real quick. It'll end it fast. If it doesn't, his eyes will start to water and you can hit him a couple more times. Right? Hey, I used to give my friends advice like that in high school, right? Did you ever do that? Guys, you grew up? Okay, you're looking at me. No, we didn't, Pastor. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so that was, that's the kind of advice I got, right? Somebody picking on you? Here's what you do, Pratt, you know? And they tell you how you can beat this guy up so he'll never do it to you again, you know? It was always, how can you get even? How can you get even? How can you get even? And then here now we're taught, don't seek to get even. People are going to notice that. Treat your wives with kindness and with respect and as precious. The wives, be respectful to your husband. Live differently than the culture. And as you do, people are going to say, hey, you know, so the question's going to come. Why do you live the way that you live? Even though it means that sometimes you end up suffering for it. And he says, be ready for that and be ready to give them an answer. And that answer is Christ because of Jesus. Why don't you go watch the movies with it, those, th- those dirty movies? You know, why, why don't you, why don't, hey, we're all going to the nudie bar afterwards. Why don't you go with us? You say, well, Pastor, no one, hey, they're all over the, on our drive the other day, down 19 to St. Petersburg, I was shocked at how many nude places there were. And you're embarrassed to look at the sign. You know what I mean? You're driving down the road, <laughs> you know. And we're going to a church event. And I was shocked. I didn't realize that there's, you know, my wife always complains. She said, Hudson is terrible. Hudson, well, guess what? It's all down 19, all the way to St. Petersburg. Probably all the way to Miami. Probably all the way to the Keys, I'm guessing. I don't know. But, and, and so somewhere there's business. Somebody's frequently, frequently these places. And, and I know that, that if you work in certain places, you'll get invited there are people that go to places like that. Hey, why don't you come with us? What are you going to do when that moment comes? What if it's your boss inviting you? you know, and you're trying to get promoted. You're trying to climb the ladder of success a little bit. What are you going to do? I hope you say no. I hope even if that means you lose your job, you'll say no. Even if that means that you suffer exactly what the passage says, that you suffer for doing what's right. And you know what? In the process, oftentimes people will say, why? Why why do you do this? You get to share Christ. And you say, yeah, I've done that before, but you know what? They didn't come to Jesus. Well, first of all, you don't know if they'll come to Jesus later down the road. Not everybody comes to Jesus the moment you witness to him or the moment I witness to him. I witnessed to my brother-in-law a number of times and he never accepted Christ. And then he, he goes in the interviews for a position at a Christian school because he wants to get his kids out of the Broward County schools. And, and Dr. Wackus, the headmaster at, at Westminster uh, Academy there, which was associated with Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, never met my brother-in-law before. The first time he talks to him, Tom accepts Christ as his savior in his office. I think, hey, I witnessed this guy 20 times and he never trusted Christ. 
Then you begin, okay, maybe I need to take some classes or something. <laughs> I'm doing something wrong here. And the bottom line is, is one person, one person plants and another person waters, but it's the Lord who gives the increase. And just because you had the opportunity to share why you live the way you live and, and you're hoping Jesus Christ with somebody, they didn't come to Christ, don't walk away feeling rejected and defeated. Oh man, you know, this is, I tried to do what the Bible says and, and they didn't come to Christ anyways. Somewhere down the road, somewhere down the road. And my brother worked for the Newport Ritchie De- Police Department for a number of years. And I remember going up with him, I riding with him on the weekends. They used to, the city of Newport Ritchie let, used to let you ride with the officers at night. You had to fill out a little paper releasing them of responsibility. And so a lot of times on the weekend, it, for me it was sort of you know, fun and exciting to ride along, pretend I was a cop, couldn't get out of the car, couldn't carry a gun, couldn't, you know, just pretend. And <laughs> so we, I'd ride along with them. But you know, sometimes we'd pull up and, and the, one, I remember one time on Highway 19 they were doing radar, just on that side of the bridge, be careful, on the s- south side of the bridge, uh, the, one of the Newport Ritchie officers was taking radar as people were heading north. And we, we pulled in, Glenn pulled in, and, and we said, we got out of the car, and he, he, we're talking to the officer. And, and he, there's another officer that pulled in. You see that a lot of times. It was slow that night. And, and the guy starts telling a dirty joke. And, and they all start laughing. And Glenn just sort of walks away. And there were a lot of times that he didn't join in with the boys. And, and oftentimes he may have questioned whether or not how effective of a witness he was for Christ. But you know what? Even to this day, he has a good reputation with those people. And some of those people have asked him to do their wedding. Some of those people have asked them to do their funerals or funerals of other people. On it. And, and so ju- what I'm saying is you don't know what's going to happen down the road. You live the way that Christ wants you to live now. You be ready to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you. Make that what your life is all about. And then let the Lord take care of the results. But that's how the church spread. That's why, that's why Christianity flooded the known world at that time, so much so that the, the Roman Empire became afraid of the growth of the Christian community. That's one of the reasons why some, many historians believe that Nero blamed the fires when he burnt Rome on the Christians. They were becoming too numerous too large and pose the, even though they pose no real threat because the Bible says obey those in authority over you which included the Caesars. The Christians were probably the least, least of his worries but he didn't realize that because they were growing at such alarming rates and such alarming numbers. It was, he, he saw it as part of his duty as well as many of the other Caesars to persecute them and put them to death. Continue to preach the gospel. It is better, verse 17, it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. If if they persecuted our Lord, they will persecute us. Don't let it stop you. Your persecution may not be physical. It may not be the loss of your homes. It may not be being thrown into jail. It may simply be people making fun of you or laughing at you or rejecting your message. But don't let it stop you sharing the wonderfully good news that there is the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting through trusting Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Let's pray. As we close in prayer this morning, let me extend to you an invitation if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior to trust Him this morning. Christ came into this world born of the Virgin Mary by a miraculous birth caused by the Holy Spirit of God. Lived a perfect life. The only man who has ever lived a perfectly sinless life. He was both man and God. 100% man and 100% God at the same time. Theologians call it the hypostatic union. A unique thing that has never happened before will never happen again. God taking on flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. He not only lived the perfect life, but he taught us how to live. And not only did he teach us how to live, but he taught us how to have a relationship with God the Father through faith in him. In fact, he said that's the only way. That's the only way to have a relationship with God the Father. No matter what you have been taught or what you may think, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. 
By that he meant putting your faith and your trust in him as the one who would pay for your sins on the cross. And not only die there for your sins, but then rise from the dead, proving he was who he claimed to be and continuing to offer you eternal life. If you have never accepted Christ as your Savior this morning, would you do so? In the quietness of your mind, right where you sit? If you believe that Christ died for you and paid for your sins and rose again, just call out to him and express that to him. Believe on him. Put your faith and trust in him. You may want to express it to him with a simple prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins, that you paid for them all. And I recognize this morning that there's nothing I can do to earn salvation, and so I put my faith and my trust in you and what you did for me on the cross. Forgive me of my sins. Give to me eternal life. I'm trusting in you for my salvation. If that was the prayer of your heart this morning, you meant that without anyone opening your eyes or looking around, would you just raise your hand and let me know that you asked the Lord to be your Savior? Is there anyone? Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else this morning? That's the most important decision and the most wonderful decision you can make because it begins your relationship with the living God. And you now have the forgiveness of sins. You are one of God's children. I, th I see your hand. Thank you. I want to encourage you to go on walking with the Lord. Attend church so that you can learn about Christ and fellowship with his family. Read your Bible and pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for those who raised their hand this morning and I pray now that your Holy Spirit would work mightily in their lives to affirm to them their salvation and, and to move in them to cause them to walk with you, to be willing to, to live for you no matter what that may involve. And as the days go on, it might get worse and worse even here in America, Lord. So help us to be prepared. And Father, for all of us, uh, as this weekend has been filled with sort of a, a reigniting for me, I pray that it would be a reigniting for all of us of our desire to live as Christ lived, to share the good news with men and women and children that Jesus Christ saves. Father, may we leave this place with, a, a, again, a rekindled passion to do that, not only this day, but each and every day of our lives. We ask for your help in this in Jesus' name. Amen.